Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Gray Center, home of uh, our Southern Frontenac Community Services. Uh, I'm David Townsend. I'm the executive director of the agency, and uh, I've just been asked to say a few words about who we are and what we are and what we try to do before I turn it over to Alita and Owen and the reason why you're here this afternoon. Um, Southern Frontenac Community Services is celebrating its 25th year in providing services to rural Kingston, South Central and North Frontenac as of this year. So it's a pretty neat milestone for us. Uh, two primary focuses of work. One is, is supporting our seniors so that they can stay in their own homes in our community as long as possible. Um, and we do that through activities like our adult day or foot care or home help or respite or meals on wheels, whatever a senior needs to stay at home, we'll do that. The other one is providing assistance to the low income people in our, in our community, whether it's through financial assistance or the food bank. But as you know, in today's world, um, the distance from those who have to those who are struggling is growing daily. And our job is also to keep uh, those people who are struggling in their own homes as long as possible. We're very proud to have the Grace Center as our new home. Uh, in about another week, it will officially be ours. We've completed at least a purchase with the United Church. Uh, so for a not-for-profit agency to, take, to be taking on ownership of a building is kind of a huge endeavor in, in our world. Um, but I'm very, very glad to be able to uh, use the Grace Hall to benefit the arts community in, in South Frontenac as well. Um, it's a way that we can turn this room in, back into its original purpose from 1861, and that's to welcome the community with open arms. And that's what we're very proud to do. So I'd like to say thank you for coming. I'd like to turn the mic over to Alita Karsted, who will lead off the procession for today. So Alita, thank you. Hi. So we've had... Uh You've had the art hanging here for about almost three months now, and uh, it's it's very uh, wonderful to have a place that that is is so expansive and bright and uh, and great for for viewing, and uh, and to be able to actually have it be able to hang here for free of charge, and uh, that any of the art that sells ten percent goes to the the community. Um, now. What we actually, this is my stuff over on this side, and uh, I've been working uh, painting this past year in partnership with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. We started out here in the, um, in the fall of 2012 and then uh, did some paintings in the Frontenac Arch and in the places where the uh, the new places where where Nature Conservancy uh, was was uh, getting land to protect, and uh, then the next spring back out here again, and then in the summer we went to New Brunswick. This is my husband Fred Schuler, and and this is Owen Clarkin, and we all went out to New Brunswick. To uh, and I was painting, and they were exploring in all the places that I painted. So uh, in the Musquash Estuary. Uh, natural area of of the Nature Conservancy out there, and uh, so the most of the Musquash Estuary paintings have sold. You can see my paintings on alitacarstad.com. So you can go back into older posts and and see the the New Brunswick ones as well. So we uh, have a, a nonprofit organization called Fragile Inheritance, and its goal is to to gather knowledge about natural and about nature, and in particular how it's been changing over the course of the decades. And one of our big projects is called the 30 Years Later Project, where we go back to the places we've been before. But we also um, are gathering field notes and uh, natural history records from naturalists and scientists, and archiving them on a big database and. Uh, and just keep on, keep on keeping on. Uh, generally, it's on a shoestring, and uh, and we are very happy to have Owen be be our associate. And uh, he, Fred, is is his uh, forte uh, is invertebrates, 
and, uh, and invasive plants and animals. And Owen is our botany guy, and he particularly loves trees. And that big rock elm there is, is act was actually commissioned by Owen f for me to paint. And uh, it's, it's going to be part of a series of, of large paintings of trees. Owen is also working on a book of the trees of eastern Ontario. So uh, I think without further ado, I'll, I'll hand the mic over to, to Thanks, Owen. Thanks, Lita. So hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful day. Uh, you don't know what the venue's gonna be when you uh, sign up to do a talk, but I, I did notice not only is it a nice day here today, but uh, I looked across the field uh, just this way, and the trees outside are kind of nice and notable as well. So my talk may at the very end have a bit of a field trip component, at least on the front stoop, and we can peer with binoculars at some shagbark hickories and even a rock elm I noticed. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk today about what I, what I like to call trees worth knowing. Um, Nothing's really original left in the 21st century. So where did I get my title from? I got it from a book written a century ago called Trees Worth Knowing by, uh, what was it, Julia Rogers. Excellent, ch charming book, sort of full of poetry and uh, profound insights about trees of Eastern North America. And uh, one of those books that just inspires one to... Sorry, thanks. One, one of those uh, books that just sort of inspires one to go out and uh, look at trees uh, maybe a little more... Uh, with a little more intensity than they would otherwise. But I've been looking at trees sort of in a peculiar way since I was quite little. Um, when I was f around four, I just started noticing huge elms on a fence line that I grew up at in, in Russell, Ontario. And uh, ever since then, I guess there wasn't enough other children to play in my neighborhood or something, so I just started <laughs> with Hosey's Trees of Canada, trying to identify whatever I could, and uh, here we are today. So I'm going to talk about a lot of the trees that are maybe... Um, not in the public uh, consciousness, not in the pop culture today. But of course I like all trees, especially even the, the well-known ones such as sugar maple and white pine. But they're not being shunned today, they're just not being focused on. So let's get going. So what trees are worth knowing? I would say all of them. This is a nice shot of a pretty expansive forest um, near Cornwall, Ontario called Summerstown Forest. Um, you're looking at pretty mature second growth forest of hemlock and yellow birch and red maple and uh, right behind me is poison sumac which I didn't back into fortunately and uh, so if I had a wish it'd be that uh, people you know correct myself included could recognize all the trees um, hemlocks are sort of a fairly obscure one too because the timber uh, companies don't really have much interest in them because they're not valuable wood so even when I was um, around 15 I remember I first stumbled into a hemlock in in nature and I hadn't seen one before and I just luckily I'd memorized in the books what they looked like and it's like okay that's a hemlock but so that, that's that's one worth knowing that I'm not going to really focus on but they are worth knowing too so especially some trees I would say are worth knowing um, I was going to come here and claim that uh, this particular individual species uh, anyone know what that is anyone in the audience who doesn't know what I obsess over that's a rock elm <laughs> um, I was going to come here and say, this tree is really rare, you know, like I, I, I slam on the brakes and almost cause accidents when I find them driving down the road. Well, guess what, you have one just across uh, your, on your, in your field there. But this is a, a rather big one I just noticed about two weeks ago growing near, um, sort of between Merrickville and North Gore in uh, Marlboro Forest. That's a, one of the bigger ones I've found, I think. Beautiful tree. That's a rock elm. It's the same one in the painting, but that one's bigger. Um, there's a lot of, lot of people like to sort of worry about what's native and what's not native and people maybe will open uh, you know, a book and look at the range maps and there'll be dots or sort of little areas indicating what's native in your town and maybe the next town over this tree if you look at the map maybe it's not native. I would like to be a little more open-minded uh, than that and um, what we're looking at here this is a map produced by um, a fellow called Schmidt just this year um, and I'm just basically showing how great this map is for him. And this, this color map shows number of species, and blue, blue is a lot. Uh, this shows quite well that Eastern North America uh, has a rich biodiversity of tree species. And people who first encountered this forest called it the Eastern Forest. Nobody was too worried about Boreal or Carolinian or Great Lake St. Lawrence or Southern Plain. It's just the Eastern Forest. 
And to, to an extent, I would argue that uh, anything growing sort of in this area where my hand is, is native to here. Because, you know, tree ranges are kind of accidental. You know, a bird brings a hackberry seed to uh, Manitoba and drops it. Now hackberry is native in Manitoba. Um, and that's kind of how it works, I think. So I'm going to talk a bit about from the perspective of, of climate change and global warming, uh, maybe some species that will be winners with the changes that are happening to temperatures and our climate quite a bit. And a lot of these species are currently fairly obscure. So there are some species as well that are native to the west, uh, and the boreal ones are often ranging across Canada. There's, there's a couple in the west, this is ponderosa pine, which if you uh, saw the last map, even edges into Nebraska and so on, it's almost kind of an eastern tree. If, um, if, if the ecosystem of the continent had remained uh, sort of untouched for another millennia or two, I kind of wonder what would have happened with some of these western species such as ponderosa pine and uh, Rocky Mountain juniper, which is a close relative of the native eastern red cedar here. But yeah, tree, tree native ranges, I'm just hammering this point in, are quite dynamic on the geological time scale. Uh, this is a Wikipedia map which just shows in the shaded zone the area of maximum uh, glaciation in the last ice age. And you can, people know this fairly well, I think, growing up here, but uh, for here and well far south of here was completely glaciated about 10,000 years ago. And the trees growing here today have had to migrate here by, a, by natural means. And I think it would be a little um, presumptuous to suggest that they had fully equilibriated in how they were sorting themselves out uh, post-glaciation. So some things were retreating, some things were you know, up, some things were going east and west. Things happen. Um, this shows just the temperature over the last uh, 2,000 years or so. And a couple of the southern species, such as uh, we'll talk about black maple and pitch pine and so on, they have sort of a small population in Ontario, at least they're not well known and so on and so on. And genetic analyses have shown that they probably had a much larger population in our area, even just maybe a thousand, a little over a thousand years ago. And then there was a cooling period that happened. This is temperature and then year zero, year 2000. There was, there was cooling happening, sort of like the Little Ice Age, and it appears that pitch pine, which is native at Gananoque and Charleston Lake and so on, was maybe just like a relic survivor that was more or less becoming extirpated with the climate that was in place. But then the Industrial Revolution happened around here, and temperatures have been rapidly going up ever since. And so species that were pretty much on the verge of uh, being extirpated in Ontario due to a cooling effect up until around 1850, perhaps maybe the trees of the future here, if things keep going up. This is a longer look at the same thing. This is years before present now, 12,000 years ago till around zero, another Wikipedia map, but I'm uh, giving credit, I guess. Um, you can see basically there was a cooling trend, glaciation was here, and there was a cooling trend, I showed basically this, which was still cooling, but there was a cooling trend happening more or less since uh, rebounding in temperature after glaciation. So again, uh, you might have heard of black maple, it's a close relative of sugar maple, it's not really well known and so on. Uh, again, genetic analyses and so on have shown that black maple probably had a pretty big population in our area. And as the, as the climate got, was getting gradually cooler and wetter up until industrialization, black maple was being squeezed further, further south and west, and sugar maple was just taking over because it prefers cool, moist climate, and black maple, its cousin, likes performs better in warmer and drier climates. Um, this is another Wikipedia image showing um, projected temperature change maybe in about 40 years from now, uh, deviation from the historic norm. And uh, unfortunately it's Fahrenheit, but the, the point would be you maybe don't get full warming everywhere, <laughs> a couple blue dots here and there, but expect the climate to get warmer and droughts to get more intense. And we're probably seeing this already. So these are a couple of pictures taken in my neighborhood in Ottawa. And uh, I'm trying to make a point here. And the point would be, uh, we plant some species, uh, and I think correctly so, that are from the boreal zone in our area too. And so this is white spruce. All these trees are white spruce. Uh, and two of them are dead. And white spruce is a boreal species that's native only till, in terms of north-south, south to around Kingston, and then it basically just drops out, even historically, um, because it doesn't uh, perform well with hot temperature. And so we had a really, really severe drought in tw the year 2012, the summer, and it was quite hot. 
And uh, these trees are just down the road from me. And I was kind of just watching them. They looked kind of stressed and so on. This was this late winter of 2013, a year ago. And this one started dying from the top down. And that's often what happens. It's almost like a diabetic patient when their, their toes start to go as well and so on. If you have conduction issues in trees, it's quite analogous. They'll, they'll lose their tops first. And this progressively went down the tree. And actually, this part at the bottom also died about a month later. And the whole tree is dead and gone now. Uh, and this is taken about two weeks ago. This tree looked fine all last year, but I'm pretty sure this white spruce also died from the drought of 2012, two years later, essentially. This one, which is shaded by the building, this building's to the south, uh, probably just made it through, and so far it's still alive. But so the point would be these boreal species, you know, it's sort of planted in monoculture sometime. There's a lot of white spruce planted, a lot of balsam fir, which is another boreal species and a close associate planted, and a lot of Norway spruce, which is an alpine European species, which is also sensitive to heat. And I'm not saying don't plant them at all, but if I was, if I was gonna do a spruce plantation, I would probably mix in some southern oriented ones as well. For example, red spruce. We'll talk about that guy today. Um, and we hear a lot about the Carolinian zone in Canada too. Uh, and um, I'm gonna try to uh, maybe clarify a little bit what that means. Um, so maybe it's just me, but naively when I was younger, growing up in Ottawa, I would say, okay, the Carolinian zone in all these maps is to my southwest, and so maybe the closest Carolinian species would be around Toronto, and as, as the crow flies. Because you know, I'm sort of an ignorant kid, I didn't think. There's also land here and here, and actually, interestingly enough, the Carolinian zone extends uh, basically all, all around the south side of Lake Ontario and into the Lake Champlain Valley up here. And so a lot of the Carolinian species, these are species that are a little south of Kingston and Ottawa, or especially Ottawa, but um, they're a little south, you know, and so on. But many of them, uh, which are considered Ontario only in Canada, extend to within around maybe 20 kilometers south of the Quebec border in the Champlain Valley. So they're almost native in Quebec too. So, you know, like a tulip tree, which maybe you find here in Canada, is also native right around here somewhere. And so, the, but the Canadian maps won't show that. And I would just, I would add something to this. Uh, the Kingston area, I would, I'm getting more evidence about various species that are native here and were missed by the surveyors. Um, I would probably lean towards calling this area here, especially just along the lake, sort of semi-Carolinian, because a lot of species are there that are uh, not really known to be there by uh, the old books. I'll give you an example. Here's tulip tree, which I just, just mentioned. Uh, these maps with this green shading are all from uh, a heroic effort by a guy called Albert Little. These maps all date to the 70s or so, and uh, the, U the United States Forestry Service basically commissioned him and a team of people to you know, go through all the herbariums, think very hard, and draw up these maps. So these maps are about 40 years old, and they're still being used as a standard, and they are quite good. But they also are 40 years old, and new results aren't incorporated. Anyways, uh, long story short, tulip tree, which is a, basically a magnolia family tree, it's a southern kind of tree, native in Ontario, native in New York State, native just south of Quebec. Nice tree, by the way, if you've never seen one. Uh, sycamore, which is uh, similar in a way. It's, uh, again, sort of, you know, southern guy, but you can't see on this resolution at all, but if I could send you a high-resolution version of this map, you'd see there's a dot right around Picton because it was growing naturally at Picton as well. And uh, one of my friends in the audience and I actually recently, we went to visit um, a big one in Enterprise, which is not too far from here, and kind of wonder, where did that tree come from? Did they import it all the way from here? Or was it growing in Enterprise already? Or, don't know. Uh, black walnut is a well-known tree, right? I mean, everybody's got black walnuts in their yard or their neighborhood at least. Um, black walnut actually has a very similar range to the previous two species. Even though black walnut's been kind of adopted as a native tree in Ottawa and Montreal and all over the place, it's basically as Carolinian as the other ones. And rather than reject black walnut, I would say let's embrace a lot of these Carolinian species in, in front yards as well. <clears throat> now this is sort of a funny one, well, in a way. Uh, Scarlet Oak won't appear in the Native Trees of Canada books because uh, it just sort of misses on all sides. It's growing at Detroit, it's growing in Rochester right up to like Fort Erie, it's growing in Syracuse, it just, it, there's actually a little dot right around Oswego slash Watertown, but it's not a native tree even to our country because it just, the dots didn't quite line up, right? 
Um, and then Hackberry is an interesting one too. So Hackberry is kind of a Carolinian tree again, this band, like the wine growing region. But then it's actually widely dispersed by birds because it's got very tasty berries. Not a heavy walnut that a squirrel's got to carry around. So birds, they fly around and they drop berries here and there and so on, I presume. So they're in Manitoba, they're in Ottawa along the rivers, they're even sort of a bit east of Montreal and Quebec. Um, so dispersal ability has a lot to do with nativeness as well, right? I mean, uh, in, uh, in Ottawa there's hackberries about a meter diameter and they're just along the, the river. And uh, most people walking down the street by Billings Bridge would say, hackberry, I've never even seen one before, unless they've been planted by the city about the diameter of the microphone or so. But there's big ones around if you uh, are lucky enough to find them. And hackberry, this is sort of interesting too, it has a southern relative called the southern hackberry. Very good dispersal abilities again. That one's native to the, the southern US, but also native to Bermuda. How did it get there? So, okay. Uh, what are some trees that are especially worth knowing, I guess? Um, I would say, let's think about the ones that are uh, maybe climate change winners, the ones that aren't being used, and maybe it would be climate change winners, so sort of the southern ones that handle drought. Uh, some of the ones that have been really um, exploited for their wood or so on and never replanted, and maybe are dropped out of the public consciousness. And just ones that, you know, not provincial tree, they're not this, not that, but maybe they're very useful and maybe they should be known. We'll explore a few of these now. So there's Hackberry. Uh, here's, here's my friend Clayton Shearer, who's about uh, six foot one, uh, standing with uh, some native Hackberries in uh, Smith's Falls, Ontario. And these are just absolute pillars of, uh, of tree. Um, it's funny, all the books will tell you that, uh, you know, you can't believe books, right, in terms of any, any book being totally right on anything, because they basically give you the summary. Uh, the books will pretty much all tell you that Hackberry is a small tree. And at the northern limit, a shrub. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, <laughs> those are pretty nice, worth a, worth a trip to Smith Falls. I'll mention, so Smith Falls is, when I'm in Ottawa, I think of Smith Falls as being a southern place, uh, but there's hackberries this large in Ottawa as well, around Billings Bridge and uh, Petrie Island and various places. Um, another one, which I'm very interested in this species, oaks in general, you pretty much can't go wrong with oaks, and in Ottawa there's only two and a half native ones, and so, you know, we have uh, bur oak, which is common, Quercus microcarpa, uh, red oak, which is common, Quercus rubra, and then the books will tell you that white oak is native as well, but you basically never find them because they're really scattered. And you go south to around Kingston or so, and you'll get chinkapin oak, maybe scarlet oak if uh, nobody's noticed them yet, uh, bear oak uh, in Puzzle Lake area. So you basically double the number of oaks, white oak becomes common. But so one of them that uh, has been known for quite some time to be around Montreal and so on is swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor. It's a close relative of bur oak that it prefers even swampier soils than bur oak does. Um, this is a tree which I think would be um, one that we want to know about uh, for a few reasons, one of which is, I'm sure everyone in the room knows very well that emerald ash borer is a huge problem, right? A lot of our uh, swampy areas in particular are dominated by black ash and or red ash, which are both abundant in swampy areas, along with red maples, mainly the other one. Uh, so we're losing half of the canopy or something like this in many of our swampy areas. Uh, so I don't know, it's, it, rather than just have red maple be left, I would almost wonder maybe it needs a friend such as a few swamp white oaks, acorns tossed here and there. Hope for the best. Uh, but actually, is swamp white oak native? So this map from Little says uh, Toronto, uh, Montreal, and you know. Well, if you dig through herbariums, you know, before the internet, people couldn't email each other and so on. So this map dates till from around the same time as Little was composing his maps. This is at the uh, Royal Ontario Museum Herbarium. Sort of a, not a great quality map and so on, but you can see these little marks. So the black square means uh, specimens have been examined and collected at certain places. Uh, white square means someone was driving by and saw it or something. And then you have a cross means a published report. And another cross means just other records. But basically, you know, I'm really interested in this area for, you know, today growing up in this area and also Sydenham's around here. You can see that there's, uh, there's squares right around Sydenham, maybe around uh, Merrickville, Ontario. And then there's a published report, if I get that right. Yeah, published report maybe around La Rose Forest or thereabouts in Ontario. So that's a tree which probably is actually native, but the books, uh, native and sparse, but a lot of the books say, swamp white oak, you can't plant that, it might be invasive, it's not native. Um, and then this is another little find from that same herbarium visit. You're never gonna be able to read this text, but I'll just tell you what it says. So, sample, 
that in a, in a you know, museum collection. Um, uh, Carl uh, he Heimberger, who's a well-known botanist who wrote Shrubs of Ontario with uh, another guy called Soper, collected this in 1951 in Renfrew County, which is northwest of Ottawa. And uh, someone was just flipping through the herbarium, I guess, and said, wait a sec, that's not a Baroque, that's a Swamp Boido. He, he, he labeled it as Baroque, where that's what you would expect there. Uh, Re-annotated here, Quercus bicolor, 1978, okay? So, but that's way, 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 way outside of the accepted range of that tree. I have to go check that out, I haven't seen that. But anyways, that's a tree worth considering. Another one, I've already mentioned pitch pine. So pitch pine, I don't know if you guys have ever driven around the Thousand Island Parkway or gone to Charleston Lake or so on and seen some kind of yellowish green, rugged looking pines that maybe looked kind of odd. That'd be pitch pine. Um, it's uh, kind of barely native in Ontario here, not in the southwest, uh, kind of odd that way, and also native around Montreal. Uh, recent discovery there actually, just it was not accepted to be native there before either. Um, but uh, it, this is a tree, so genetic studies were done on this population around 15 years ago, and they showed that huge genetic uh, variability in the population, which implies heavily that this population of trees, which is isolated now, uh, would have been much larger not that long ago, and it's just been declining, 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 probably due to competition with vegetation as the climate had been cooling before. But now we live in the 21st century where climate is warming up, and this is a fire specialist species as well. So in hot, droughty summers, this is a species which might win. Now, a lot of people will say, okay, why would you want to plant a pitch pine anyway, right? I mean, uh, they're kind of, these are two natural ones growing along uh, the St. Lawrence uh, uh, river on the Thousand Island Parkway. Oh, they're kind of rugged and kind of coarse, and uh, they are actually. I have kind of a thing for trees like that, though. But, uh, you know, they're specialists in poor soils. They're not, pines in general are not very strong competitors with other vegetation. They usually are found somewhere where maybe a sugar maple can't live anyway, so they're not going to get shaded out. So there, I mean, that's an area that gets flooded and not a great place to grow for any tree, but pitch pine can handle it. But if you plant them on good soil, uh, they turn into a stately tree. This is one growing at the uh, Dominion Arboretum in Ottawa. That's a really big, majestic tree, I would say. So they turn into nice trees. And that's a tree, so some of the quotes you'll see in books are, they will grow anywhere. <laughs> so, tree worth knowing. Uh, another one, I'd mentioned uh, and shown a picture about maybe white spruce having trouble with climate change and even Norway spruce having trouble with climate change. I'm not suggesting red spruce is going to enjoy climate change, but red spruce is primarily, I guess, an eastern species that also drifts down into the mountains of the states. But if you do this drive to New Brunswick, like I did this summer, you'll see even at the northern limit of red spruce's range, where they have reasonably hot summers, they're growing all over the exposed granite, like ridge tops everywhere, the driest of the dry and the hottest of the hot for that area. There's no white spruce there. There's uh, not, nothing else actually for that matter. So this is actually a tree that can handle, uh, doesn't like fire, fire tends to kill them out pretty easily. But in terms of just dry, droughty conditions, unless it catches fire, they're actually quite, quite able to hang on. And this is quite uh, strange too. So this is again an eastern species that's around, Ottawa's around there. They're known to be at sort of Ottawa. And then a patch in Gatineau Park, and, or sorry, Algonquin Park. But um, there's actually a funny story sort of associated with the species. So spruces are considered hard to tell apart even by botanist standards. And um, uh, the story goes uh, that uh, around 1950 or just before that, uh, a botanist was visiting Algonquin Park and noticed that uh, those spruces being carted out of the park in the logging zone aren't white spruce, that's actually red spruce. And they kind of like stop the truck, what's this, what's this all about? And all of a sudden there's a population known there, okay? They weren't even known to exist in Ontario until this time. That was like the first like, hey, they're in Ontario, that's kind of weird. We thought they were all in the Maritimes. Um, uh, a publication in Ottawa uh, in 2005 summarized the vegetation of Ottawa within 50 kilometers of, our, of the city and did not include red spruce on the Ontario side either. Uh, and then uh, the, the guy who wrote the report got a phone call saying, I'll show you a half dozen sites, just come for a field day with me. And all of a sudden there was seven sites known in Ottawa. Uh, okay. And then I was camping uh, last year or so in Bonaco, or two years ago, I think now, Bonaco Park right around there, about 100 kilometers from any of these other sites. And on Joe Perry Lake, I found a red spruce on an island. So that's a tree that's kind of out there, I think, um, not really known too well. And so this is a spruce which has valuable wood. It grows a little slower than the other ones, drought tolerant, shade tolerant, one worth knowing. 
This is a red spruce growing near Anderson Road in Ottawa. You can see it from the 417 highway. This guy, they sort of have this broad crown. It's a balsam fir beside it. And then this is one that I found uh, driving just along the road near Hawkesbury, Ontario. So they're, they're definitely out there. Not planted though. Okay, black maple is, this is one that I'm gonna really champion in a way. So everybody loves sugar maple and maple syrup and the fall colors of sugar maple and so on. So black maple is basically the, uh, the, the version of sugar maple that has a mustache or something. They're just a little different. I don't think they're the same species like some books will say. They're just, you know, they're not the same. I don't think they, they do hybridize, but I mean, some species, some books will say they're the same thing, who cares, right? If you see a true black maple, you're, you're like, that's different. Um, Little's map, one of these green maps again, he got it right in showing that it's all around this part of Ontario in the lowlands, especially. I don't know if it's much in the shield, but certainly the, uh, you know, the valleys of the St. Lawrence and the Ottawa where it's very flat, fertile soils, I've found a lot of them there. But a lot of the, a lot of the Canadian books will not show them there at all. So like uh, Ferrara's trees in Canada doesn't show them there. But here's a uh, natural one going, growing near Fred's house, uh, a town or so away in Oxford Mills. It looks kind of like a sugar maple, you know, that sort of uh, round crown. This tree's about 75 feet tall and three feet diameter. On, on the, this side of that tree, there's a huge stump as well. And uh, if you look at the bark on that stump, it shows that it's a sugar maple, okay? Because they have sort of different bark. And I use this as a bit of a demonstration. So, I, you know, this is just anecdotally, but sugar maples are known to not perform very well along roadsides and in cities and so on because they're just not the most tolerant of hot, dry, compacted soil. Black maple is sort of like the sugar, how did it, how did it diverge from sugar maple's population? It's a, it's a sort of a fork in the evolutionary line that went more towards lowland compacted soils and so on, and it handles droughts. So this tree looks like in the prime of its life, and its buddy died from something. Uh, and this just shows the bark of a black maple growing in Summerstown Forest, which is near Cornwall. It's quite corrugated. You'd never say that's a sugar maple if you, uh, if you saw that, I don't think. And there's other differences too. The twigs are a bit different and so on. But anyways, oh, one thing to mention, we're in maple syrup season right now. The maple syrup of black maple is considered, uh, maybe not superior in taste, but about 50% more sugar uh, and less boiling of the water that way. So it's a better uh, maple syrup tree too. Okay, this is one that's not native here, uh, or even you know Ottawa, or even Kingston, or even Toronto, but this is a tree which, uh, Kentucky coffee tree. It's just fascinating, and I just sort of included it on a whim. There's so many things which I didn't include today. This tree has the thickest twigs of any tree here. They're like the size of my finger. They're really, you know, they're like, they're big. Uh, and the leaves are the biggest of any leaf in Canada. They're a huge compound leaf. They leaf out like in late May or early June. They're like, they're called, uh, gymnocladus means naked branch for this reason. The latest to leaf out, the earliest to drop their leaves in the fall. They're just sort of a weird tree. Um, they're very good for cities and so on in terms of handling, you know, um, heat and uh, pollution. And I include them because uh, I guess their wood is very rot resistant as well. And so they're being cut down like kind of like the last few years really dramatically in their sort of core range around here. And so the population is crashing from human, uh, uh, human use of the wood right now. And another f factor which has affected them long term, they have a really strange seed. They're like, uh, they're one of these legume trees. And the seed is about the size of like, uh, boy, almost a ping pong ball, they're huge. And the, whatever the animal was that was supposed to eat them apparently is like, wh what animal eats this? Because nothing seems to eat them properly. Like uh, the, the mice and so on on the ground will try and they usually just give up. So, you know, and there's no bigger animal that seems to eat them. So their, their seeds just sort of fall on the ground and uh, don't do much of anything. This is a big one growing in Ottawa. This is at the border of the experimental farm. Uh, there's a wh white pine behind it. Um, this tree, so, Gymnocladus means uh, naked branch. Dioicus means uh, you have male and female trees. This is a female, so the female trees will have big bean pods about the size of a smartphone hanging from them, so you basically can't miss them. But if it's a male, then you don't know. But I've collected seeds in this guy this year too, and I don't know if there's a male near enough to actually fertilize it or not, because the, the three of them that I know in Ottawa are all females that are nearby, but uh, we'll see if I get some seeds from that guy. And there's one, so they actually, they sprout from uh, roots, sort of like a uh, rock elm or, or, a, uh, or a poplar. That's just, you know, the last year growth on one of the twigs from a sprout. Just huge, huge, huge twigs. They'd be very good in ice storms too, by the way, because, you know, the trees with the bigger leaves, 
usually have thicker twigs and fewer twigs, there's less surface area in the winter for the ice to come onto and to get stuck onto. And this is much less weight per, uh, per twig. Blue ash. So I mentioned blue ash. We should know all the ashes because they're all kind of disappearing right now. So we have white ash native here, red ash, which is very common. White ash is pretty common too. And black ash is common in swamps. They're all pretty common actually. And then in Southwest Ontario, you have a little bit of blue ash and actually a little bit of pumpkin ash, which is related to red ash. Blue ash is noteworthy because it's the only ash that's native in Eastern North America that has been shown a significant resistance to the emerald ash borer. More than half of the large mature trees in sort of this zone around Detroit where they're pretty common and the emerald ash borer first escaped, more than half of them have survived so far. And you know, the, the wave of bugs has gone through and killed everything else, all the other ashes, but a lot of the blue ashes are surviving. So if you want to have ashes in the future that are native to at least sort of our area, this is a strong candidate to uh, maybe plant in your yard. Um, they look like an ash, but they have very distinctive uh, twigs. You know, the leaves are just very typical ash. The next photo you'll see, it's got, they're called quadrangulata because if you take a cross section of their twig, it's like a square. They're kind of weird. There you go, got ridges like that. Quite attractive. And then, yeah, once again, they're uh, dry soil, drought tolerant, tolerant of all this sort of climate change business. So there is a, there's hope for at least one of the ash that's native near here. The hickories in general, again, I didn't know the, uh, the town super well when I, when I came here, so I, I wasn't gonna dwell on the hickories because they all should be better known. People don't plant hickories very often, usually because the root system is, uh, it's a taproot tree and they're hard for the people who want to move the trees to carry around, essentially. Once you get them in the ground, they're pretty much the perfect tree, okay? Like, you actually want taproot because it seeks out water, it anchors the tree from being blown over. They have very strong wood. They ice storm proof, the ones that I've seen for shagbark anyway. This is a shagbark and this is its uh, lowland relative, the shellbark hickory. Um, in this area, you'd have native shagbark. In fact, right across the field, there's pretty much all shagbark. Bitternut's pretty common here too. But then this guy, uh, shellbark, is native sort of around Toronto. And then uh, I have it on the authority of a, of a very uh, good naturalist from Kingston named uh, Jakob Mueller, that uh, pignut hickory, which I didn't show a picture of, is native in Kingston as well. But it's not accepted as being so. But he's found them growing at various sites. Um, birches, you know, uh, another thing about birch. So when I went to New Brunswick this year, uh, you know, you get in the, into these eastern species, like red spruce becomes very common, uh, gray birch becomes very common. Uh, heartleaf birch becomes common. Wait, what's heartleaf birch? Uh, so I guess about 10 or 15 years ago, people realized there's another species of birch just kind of hanging around that nobody ever really decided was a species before. It had been grouped as sort of an oddball paper birch before. Everybody knows paper birch pretty well. It was considered Betula papyrifera, which is paper birch, variety cordifolia. Cordifolia meaning heart-shaped leaf. But it's actually quite different from uh, paper birch in general. The bark looks kind of like a copper color. Like, very attractive. And, oh, this map shows them being native around Ottawa. But mo I just sort of found a random map by Googling maps of this tree. Uh, the, the sort of orthodox interpretation is that they're native around Thunder Bay, native in New York State in the Adirondacks, and sort of like maritime. But um, I was sort of wondering, where are these guys growing? So this is the bark, and you can see it's sort of a really ragged, coppery, not at all like yellow birch, if you're familiar with that tree. Uh, beautiful, I would say. Uh, and then this is um, the leaves on one that I found growing uh, not too far from here uh, in sort of a Merrickville again area. Um, and so they're not really orthodox native there by most sources, but I believe they are native there. And this photo shows two twigs off of a, what I'm gonna call a heartleaf birch at uh, this Merrickville site. And this is a conventional paper birch twig from just Ottawa. And you see these little dots on it. I mean, it's not a very, uh, the lighting's kind of poor, but there's a few dots on this paper birch. One of the key indicators for uh, heartleaf is having a lot more of the lenticels, these dots. And this tree, these trees also exhibit that characteristic. I'm waiting on the final diagnostic one, which is uh, the seeds are quite bigger, quite a bit bigger, but uh, they're too young to have seeds yet. I'm kind of wondering where they came from. Anyway, this is one you really gotta to know too, if you ever do uh, hiking in swamps, which probably you don't, but uh, I was happy enough to finally encounter poison sumac. This is a rare tree, a shrub tree, uh, closely related to poison ivy and actually more toxic than poison ivy. And uh, the map kind of has it right, I think. They're, they're very scattered. Nobody wants to collect them 
because you're the botanist who's out in the field and they're, you know, do I want to grab that and put it in my bag and take it somewhere and dry it and it might hurt my hand, right? So, you know, maybe part of the spotty representation is not only it's, maybe, maybe it is spotty, but maybe also botanists don't want to really touch it a whole lot. Anyway, it's interesting. There's a dot maybe around Almont or so, and there is indeed a known population there. And there's a dot around Cornwall, and I found one there too. It's kind of strange. Maybe, maybe it's just the truth. So here's, um, here's an example of a, of a poison sumac growing in the Almont area. It's hard to see, but um, so the leaves are kind of like a sumac, but kind of not. The, um, the leaves, they're compound, and they sort of point up in a V, almost like a turkey vulture angle. Have you ever seen turkey vultures floating around? So if you see a shrub that's kind of like that, and the leaves are really kind of pointing up, kind of don't touch it. And then they're male and female trees as well. So people will tell you, watch out for the berries. They're kind of like poison ivy berries. They turn white in the winter. This one is a female that has berries that are kind of green. I took this in early in the season. Uh, the berries are little berries that hang. They turn white in the winter. But the problem is half of the population is going to be male, and that won't work for those ones. And then this one here, they turn a nice bright red uh, color in fall. That's one growing in uh, Summerstown Forest, which is near Cornwall. Okay, I will end with the elms, which are my sort of my passion, or my main passion. Okay, so uh, we have three native elm tree uh, species here. The American elm, which everybody knows very well. And we have two less common and pretty much obscure, I'd say, by these days, uh, elms, the rock elm and the slippery elm. Um, and I get a little annoyed when I see uh, sort of statements like, oh yeah, you know, like the, the really bad thing about ash borer is that it's killing all the ash. And when, el when Dutch elm disease went through, it just killed you know, that one elm that was there, right? <laughs> Wikipedia says that. Um, and things like uh, the recovery guide to trees in Ontario, not mentioning that uh, the two uncommon elms even exist, which really... <gasps> so. Let's talk about elms a little bit. So when people think of elms these days, they probably think of that, which is, oh, there's a decaying American elm. They don't get big anymore. They die all the time. Kind of true. This is one growing near Athens, Ontario, that I photographed last year. I guess I immortalized it after it was too late. Um, but there's actually a pretty good number. I mean, they're scattered, but there's a pretty good just number that you can drive people to if they're interested of very big ones that are also left. This is an absolute humongous tree growing in uh, Elmer, Quebec. Uh, it's not remarkably tall, it's about 88 feet tall, but the diameter, it's five feet diameter. This is my mother standing beside it for scale. And that's growing. Uh, there's a garage here. There's an asphalt uh, parking, you know, it's a parking lot. It has a dumpster at its base. So there's like a truck always slamming a big dumpster right, right at its base. And there's a big road. And then it has like one quarter of its surface area is, uh, is grass. So it's, it's quite happy. This shows how urban tolerant these trees actually are. So, you know, if you flash back to, you know, 50 years ago, this would have been the, the most common street tree. And when Dutch elm disease wiped out most of them, you know, it's now, now they're, you can't plant them because they'll just die. They might, they might not. Here's a different one that's uh, growing, about the same size trunk, uh, growing near Carl, uh, Carlsbad Springs in uh, the Ottawa area. And uh, this guy's six foot four. You know, this is Justin Peter, a good friend of mine. And it just shows again, huge, huge trunk, uh, beautiful, almost, you know, buttresses and so on. There's, there's a few big ones out there that are really nice to see. Worth knowing. Now, one thing really to pay attention to with the elms, trees in general, if you want to know a certain kind of tree, uh, what is their fingerprint for identification? I mean, their leaf, kind of. Uh, their branching pattern, kind of. But if, if I want to know a tree that's closely related to another one and make sure I have the right one, what I usually try to get is a twig or a fruit or a flower. But fruits and flowers are kind of temporary. So if you get a twig that has buds on it especially and so on, then you kind of know this is that tree once you know what they look like. So again, the lighting is not the best, but American elm has sort of brown, not that pointy buds that kind of zigzag around. They have a characteristic look. These all came from the top of a tree that was growing slowly that a squirrel had clipped off while it was eating the twigs and the buds. They were just on the ground under it. Um, now, something about slippery elm. This is one of the uncommon ones that's native here. Um, they grow kind of in a weird way. The books will say they look like American elm, but not, which is very helpful. Um, they do look kind of different. The branches kind of are, they kind of wave around a bit. This is the biggest one that I've found uh, in the area, uh, East Ontario, West Quebec. This is 65 feet tall, about uh, 32 inches diameter. And this is one that's a little bit smaller in Copeland Park in Ottawa. And that's a basswood beside it, but this is the slippery elm here. Um, but uh, when I go to the herbariums and look for slippery elm uh, records, you know, where are they growing? 
something very funny. So the, the botanists get led astray as well. So they read in the book, if they're not familiar with the tree, they have very fuzzy leaves, very, very rough hairs, they kind of scratch your fingernail. And so I think a lot of the botanists who are maybe specialists in something other than trees find a rough-leafed elm, and a young American elms often have very rough leaves, by the way, uh, scratch your nail kind of thing, and like, yep, slippery elm. And then they like send it off to the Royal Engineering Museum and it's there. So I was just there a few months ago and about half of the records for slippery elm were actually American elm, which is kind of interesting. So I'm gonna tell you how to not make that mistake yourself. Um, if you get a twig on a slippery elm, and these are both slippery elm twigs from actually the same tree growing on Mitchell Owens Road in Ottawa, uh, they'll have sort of Anne of Green Gables kind of orange red hair when they're young. In this, so this is sort of midsummer, um, very red and hairy uh, buds. And the twigs are kind of thick and stout. And of course, they're, well, they're called slippery because if you chew on the twigs or the branchlets, it has like a slippery, uh, like mucilaginous sort of like bark, right? And it's actually a medicine. <laughs> if you Google slippery, I'm the first thing you get is medicine. Um, and then this is the same tree about a, a week and a half or two weeks ago. And again, I'm not sure if the lighting you're getting, but they have sort of like white lines on the buds. The buds are big and the red hairs are still kind of there, but they've been weathered off a bit. You'd never confuse that with an American elm. Not at all the same. Actually, slippery elm and American elm are not even that closely related. There's elms, but one thing to really watch out for, and I'm kind of raising awareness on this, is uh, there's a non-native elm called Siberian elm. It's the only common non-native elm here. Um, and it actually very uh, easily hybridizes with slippery elm. And people planted Siberian elm because it was Dutch elm disease proof, essentially, once all of the American elms got whacked, right? And so, okay, it had that going for it, but a major disadvantage is they pollinate each other, very, they're very closely related. And slippery elm has a lot of uses for humans. It has this medicinal bark and it's easy to split wood that's very strong. Siberian elm has almost no, none of these advantages, basically none of them actually. And um, so Siberian elm is actually more common than slippery in most of Eastern Ontario now. And guess what? The native tree is being completely flooded with uh, pollen of that tree. So it's hard to get them pure anymore if they're young. So watch out for that. Oh, I, I should have pointed out. The one, the one key difference of Siberian and slippery. So, so this is a hybrid of the two that's growing in Ottawa. Uh, I, I didn't show a picture of uh, Siberian just because I didn't want to, you know, clutter it too much. But Siberian uh, elm has really tiny thin twigs, really tiny buds. Slippery elm is at the other extreme, huge twigs, huge buds. When they come together, it looks like a normal American elm almost. But they have red hairs and they're round, they're kind of weird. Anyway. Last one, uh, everybody if they've heard of rock elm will know that it doesn't look like an elm tree, right? It's the one that kind of grows upright and uh, doesn't fork into a vase or so on. I got asked to survey this property, which is just a little bit northwest of Quebec by the person who owned that tree. And they're like, oh, you like rock elms, come see my rock elm. And I said, wow, this is also a nice rock elm. That's not a rock elm, it's a rock elm. Uh, this looks kind of like an American elm. Uh, but uh, they just have a lot of vari variability in the growth form. So this guy, uh, doesn't look like a rock elm, but it is one. How can you tell it's a rock elm, if you want to know? Everybody knows that they have corky twigs, and this and that, sometimes they do. Um, if you want to know technically, again, you have to look at the fingerprint, which is the twigs and the flowers and the fruit. Rock elm is actually, the one that doesn't look like an elm, is actually very closely related to American elm. They don't hybridize because American elm has double the chromosomes, and so they're basically incompatible. But they're closely related and they look quite similar until they diverge from each other in growth form. The buds of uh, rock elm, which you maybe can just make out there, these are early in the season, they're very pointy and kind of yellowish. And the leaf is kind of symmetric and the veins are kind of closer, but basically the buds are the key. They're pointy and they're kind of yellowish, once you know the difference between the two. And if you find cork, that means it's a rock elm too, probably. Although English elm, which is uh, sometimes planted, also has cork. But when they're really corky, they can be really corky. That's one that I found near Smith's Falls, it's just like... You know, I've heard some people say that they, uh, some botanists have told me they get cut down sometime because people think it's an American elm that's caught a disease. And it's like, oh my God, look at that disease on that. Is that black knot? So rock elms have similar bark to American elm. It's kind of, you know, it's gray. It's a bit deeper ridged, but uh, I think they're quite attractive. You know? And then uh, here's two nice big ones growing in Ottawa. Um, I've talked to people who both know these trees who are kind of botanists and they both told me those are really strange looking American elms. <laughs> They're happy to hear there are rock elms. Actually, uh, this one is fairly large too, a bit larger than this one. When I showed uh, the fellow this one, he said, that, that can't be a rock elm. And I said, why can't it be a rock elm? Uh, it's too big, they don't get that big. And then I said, well, it's a rock elm. And then I pointed to the one in the painting, uh, a photograph, and he said, oh, <laughs> they get even bigger. 
So I'll end with that one. This guy is growing in Merrickville. So this tree was historically documented to grow actually quite large, not as large as American elm, but uh, you know, a big tree. And this indeed is a big tree that made me uh, slam on the brakes and park my car when I saw it. This tree is uh, 92 feet tall, uh, three and a half feet diameter, so a meter diameter, has that good growth form. This tree was really heavily logged and like exported as square timber and it's the hot, you know, for shipbuilding. It's the hockey stick tree in a country called Canada that likes hockey. Uh, you know, it was made for building, it was used for building pianos and vehicles and so on. So that tree was really like, as Harlow says, he's a well-known author, drastically overlogged. So I was shocked to see one that big. That tree's probably, I would say around 200 or 250 years old. And I will end there. Thank you for your attention. By, by the way, that's a rock elm too. Any questions? <laughs> yes.